All right? If everybody could have a seat, we are ready to start our next segment. Once again with us, we have Matt McFarlane and Amanda, Amanda Hahn. With 38 years of experience combined, I was told, which is really a relief. I thought some secret potions going on over here. They specialize in uh, bringing tax saving strategies traditionally only available to Fortune 500 companies. They have both had experience with big four public accounting firms, and they specialize in clientele at deals in real estate. So welcome back to both of you. How's everyone doing? Breakfast is good, huh? I had my fair share, obviously. But um, today we're talking about year-end tax planning strategies, especially for real estate investors. Uh, it's a good time of year. It's the beginning of November. You still have time to make some moves before year-end and see what you can do to save on taxes. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to focus our, our energy and our, our presentation on today. I know some of you might have just filed your taxes on October 15th, right? Don't be shy. Raise your hands. So you might be thinking, what? I just finished. Why are we talking about taxes again? So actually, now is a really, really great time to plan for 2015 taxes. Yeah, we were, we were joking with one of our clients that she was, I think, the last client on the 15th. And, and it was like, and her friend was also the last client on the 15th. I was like, what's going on here, you know? And I said, oh, well, we're going we're gonna to ask you again in January for your stuff. So it's just right around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so we like to start our presentations with kind of a pop quiz to kind of get, uh, get some energy in the room, get some participation. So if you happen to, the rules of the game, or if you happen to know the, an the answer, just raise your hand and we will call on the first person that we happen to see. And uh, if you happen to win, um, Vanna here has some, uh, some door prizes for you. So. All right, the first question is, which of the following celebrities went to prison for failing to file tax returns? Is it A, Nicolas Cage, B, Lamar Odom, C, Wesley Snipes, D, Donald Trump? I think, I don't know. C, Wesley Snipes is correct, yes. Uh, Lamar, it's, I think he's got his own problems right now. They don't have nothing to do with prison. Donald's got his own problems, and we'll see where that goes. <laughs> But we have a picture of Wesley Snipes. This was actually taken from prison when he turned 50 a couple years ago. So he's looking healthy, living off of taxpayer dollars I think prison. he's working again now, too. So, so kind of talking about some tax changes for 2015. I don't know if you guys remember, but the end of last year, December of 2014, Congress actually extended some tax benefits but they did it in December of 2014, which gave us less than 30 days to plan proactively for the rest of 2014. And so, you know, what about 2015? There hasn't been a lot of effort that we've seen, obviously, in terms of Congress talking about tax changes. I think a lot more of the conversation will happen, obviously, after the presidential election. But I can tell you, it's certainly not a lot has changed for 2015, unfortunately. Um, some of the things that they put that it extended at the end of 2014, they extended them for 2014. So they actually expired at the end of 2014. So some of the more common ones in terms of real estate, uh, those of you kind of familiar with, if you had debt forgiveness on your primary residence, there was a rule that allowed you not to have to pay tax on a certain amount of it. Uh, that law expired at the end of 14. Um, there was deductibility of mortgage insurance premiums that for your primary residence that also ex expired. Another one is Section 179, kind of a in bonus depreciation, ways to depreciate big chunks of money on some of your, your, your assets that you purchased. That also, they've dwindled the numbers. They're still in existence, but they've dwindled the numbers for 15. So are they going to do anything? I mean, I don't know. You know, your guess is as good as mine. Um, if I had to be a betting man, I'd say probably not, just because we haven't seen any motion. But last year wasn't necessarily the first time that they waited to the end of the year to do something either. So... Um, yeah, so I would just keep an eye out, you know, contact your tax advisor, um, or if they're sending you newsletters or we're sending you newsletters, just make sure you're kind of reading it, because towards the end of the year, a lot of times is when these great changes or loopholes actually come out. Um, and I think it's strategic on the government side, right? Because who's really doing planning the week between Christmas and New Year's, right? Not much. So they sign into law all these loopholes, hoping that we don't really have time to implement or to look at those. So here's a little, little something, myth versus fact. Uh, I think one of the things that we hear a lot is that 
we're all doomed to lose all of our money to taxes. And that's actually, it might be a feeling that you, a strong feeling you have, but it's actually, it's actually a myth. I mean, you know, if you were going to lose all your money to taxes, then you'd have a 100% tax rate, right? But if your tax rate is 30%, you make a dollar, you're still keeping 70 cents. So just, just keep that in mind. Um, but, you know, as a fact, there are, you know, as I was talking about earlier, there are things that you can do proactively to save on taxes. And there's, as we're going to talk about, there's a lot more things you can do now versus waiting until April 15th to kind of then figure out what you can do to save on taxes. Mm -hmm. So anyone heard the term year-end tax planning before? Anyone done year-end tax planning before with their advisors? I think it's uh, kind of a paint a picture. I think an easy way to kind of see it is think about a, I don't know, a, a sporting event, a basketball game, a baseball game. It's really where, where you know you might be a sports fan and you care what happens throughout the game, but in reality, the only thing that really matters is what the scoreboard says when the game is over, right? So it's kind of the same thing with taxes: is what does your numbers look like on December 31st? That's going to determine for the most part what your tax situation is going to look like. Now, there are still some things you can do after year-end, as I was saying earlier, to kind of reduce your taxes for this year, but there are a lot less than opportunities you might have now, between now and year-end. All right, another pop quiz. So the IRS allowed which of the following people to take a tax deduction for their breast implants after a court hearing? And if you've seen this before, you can't raise your hand and win again, just FYI. So A is a Dolly Parton. There's a lot of moaning up here, by the way. B, Lindsay Lohan. C, Chesty Love. Or D, Bruce Norris. Bruce Norris. Oh, we're in the back? Did somebody raise their hand? Oh, go ahead. Right. This one's good. No, that's Dolly incorrect. Parton. Not Dolly Parton. Any other guesses in the front row? D, Chesty. Chesty. Looks like we have a Chesty Love fan. <laughs> right in the front row. Look at that. It's always a guy that gets this answer right. I don't know why. That's just always the case. See, I, when, when Amanda first put this, uh, this slide together a couple of years back, I was like, come on, you know, Chesty, that can't be a real name. But, you know, nowadays, you know, go to Google Images, type in Chesty Love, and you'll see exactly who we're talking about. Um, but, yeah, so what's the best part? Chesty Love, we'll call her, uh, she was a, let's call her an entertainer. She did that for a living, and she uh, actually... Took, uh, took the IRS to court over her, her, her breast implants, and, and she won because she was able to show that they were, the, the, the tax code is ordinary and necessary for your business. So how you, how you argue that, I have no clue, but... Um, yeah, so that's just the, you know, we put that up just to show you that any expense could potentially be a tax deduction. So the question you ask yourself when you're spending money is, is it reasonable that this money I'm spending is associated with my business? Okay, whether it's real estate business or a medical business, um, that's what the IRS looks for. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things we want to touch on first in, in terms of tips and strategies, and this is an area that we see often overlooked, is, is really the personal expenses of the business owner. There's a lot of people in the room here who are doing real estate, right? And, you know, you guys are, nowadays people are, using their cars, obviously, they're using gadgets, uh, cell phones, tablets, whatever the case may be. There's a lot of things people are using travel costs that you may not necessarily think right off the bat might be a business-related expense, but there's a lot, there's a lot of opportunity there for, for you to take tax deductions that we see missed a lot. Um, I think you know, going to events like this, meeting investors like yourselves, I think one of the co common questions we get a lot is, I just don't know what I can deduct. And as Amanda was saying, one of the un underlying principles is just, is it ordinary and necessary for your business? You know, is it ordinary for you to spend $50,000 to do something? You know, maybe, maybe not. But is it ordinary for you to go to an event like this and learn about more about your business and incur the mileage, incur the cost to come to the event? Yes, that's ordinary, that's, and, and that's necessary for you to expand your business and your knowledge and things like that. So that's one example, I, I think... Um, the biggest one is autos. We see that missed a lot in terms of just keeping track of your mileage. People, maybe they don't think it adds up very much, but if you take the time to log your miles for a couple months and you can actually see what, it, what a benefit it would be if you add it up and take the tax deduction for that. Do we have any questions about that? Or Yeah, we always get a lot of questions about car expenses. Any takers? So we have clients who invest out of state 
Um, and if you have out-of-state properties, but you obviously drove here today from home for this brunch, right? It's still tax deductible. Okay, you drive to deposit your rent check. So your property does not have to be in state, right? All the other real estate related stuff can be tax deductible. Question? It's a good question, and, and it, it brings up a good point, is that one of the other common misconceptions we hear a lot is, well, I don't think I have a business because I don't have an entity set up. But the IRS actually doesn't care whether you have an entity set up. You know, if you have a rental property or multiple rental properties in your personal name or even an LLC that gets reported on your Schedule E, you still have a business. You could have, you could have a sole proprietorship that doesn't, you have no entity whatsoever. Uh, now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but if that people do that, obviously, you can still take tax deductions. So to your question, whether it's better for an S-Corp or on your Schedule E, I think it's going to come down to kind of what the underlying expense is. For something like this, if your S-Corp business is property management or something real estate related, there's probably an argument that you could deduct it there. Um, I would probably venture to deduct it on that side versus a, against the rentals just because it reduced ordinary income and income that could be subject to self-employment taxes and things like that. So, mm -hmm. but it's going to be kind of fact dependent on each person, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's actually true. So for those of you who don't have legal entities, you are still eligible for most, if not all the regular tax deductions that Matt mentioned earlier, you know, cell phones, going to clubs, mileage, um, whether you have an LLC or S corp or not, that does not limit you from deducting those. Again, the IRS looks at, the expense that you incurred, is it ordinary and necessary for your business, right? And your business is real estate investment, okay? Yeah. Another strategy that's really, really strong at your end is uh, income deferral. And this is just kind of a fancy way of saying, <coughs> do you have any control or can you control over when you actually receive your income? So kind of paint some examples, I guess. So maybe you have a consulting business where you can kind of control when you bill your customers. So if you happen to wait to December 31st to bill somebody, it's likely you're not going to get paid before December 31st. So, or maybe, you know, real estate investors, you know, maybe you're going to be selling a property the last month of the year. Maybe there's a way for you to, if you could delay the closing by a week, and it closes January 1st, the benefit, the potential benefit of that is that instead of the income being taxable on your 2015 return, it's now taxable on your 2016 return. So you've delayed it by a week, but in essence, you've saved the taxes for a whole year. Now, this works if you're going to be in the same or a lower tax bracket next year. You wouldn't obviously want to defer income if you're going to end up paying more tax, a higher tax rate on the same income. But if you're going to be lower or the same, then this can work out really well. And we've seen this. I mean, people... You know, you're going to sell a property December 28th. Well, you know, maybe you, you know, you don't want to kill the deal, obviously, but if you can delay it by a few days, that can come in handy to saving money a little, little bit longer. Yeah, and on the flip side, um, if for year in planning, we look at accelerating expenses and accelerating losses. So to the exact opposite of what Matt said, if you have a property you're selling, whether a flip or a rental, and it's going to be a loss, you might want to close on that property before the end of the year so you can take the deduction now, right? Because if you wait till January, you don't get to use that benefit for a whole entire year, okay? And so these are things that our clients are looking at now, people who have properties listed, right, have things under contract, then we want to know, is it a gain, is it a loss, what's your tax situation going to be like? Um, because just with a few days movement, right, that could mean a year's worth of tax savings. Yeah, another kind of a example, you know, in terms of accelerating expenses, best way to think about that is look at, are you going to, is there any cost you know you're going to incur January, kind of February-ish, early next year? Maybe there's a recurring cost. Maybe it's, you know, mortgage insurance. Maybe it's property taxes. Might be some repairs you know you have to make. Um, we had a client that does master leasing. And so he, you know, rents a property from somebody else, sublets it to other people. And so his lease payments to the actual owner, he was able to front load a lot of those before year end and take a tax deduction for a lot of those January, February lease payments. Uh, we do the same thing with our, you know, with our office rent and stuff. We, we prepay a few months just to kind of accelerate that expense. So those are things to think about in terms of can you, you know, defer income to next year, but also accelerate expenses this year to lower your taxes this year. And if I remember correctly, I think Bruce also says he prepays a lot of his expenses. 
<laughs> but yeah, we our our, um, uh, our office building really likes us because in December we always prepay for like the next six months just to get it out. <laughs> All right, one more pop quiz, I think. So This is a serious one. <laughs> Which of the following deductions will be limited for those making $250,000 or more? Is it A, charitable donations, B, property taxes, C, mortgage interest on your primary home, or D, all of the above? Any takers? Sir? C. C, that's a popular choice. Uh, not technically accurate, but all of the above. Yes, that is correct. So this came about actually, I lose track of dates sometimes, but at the end of last year or two years ago, they, they put a new basically law that's limiting your itemized deductions. So if you think about your personal tax return, charitable donations, property taxes, mortgage interest on your primary home, these are all itemized deductions show up on your Schedule A. And so they're putting a limit on, a, a little bit of a limit on it for those people making 250000 or more as a single or 300000 as a or more as a married couple. And so it's just, it's not, it's not, it's, it's 3% of, there's a formula, it's, it's 3% of the excess of your income over that threshold is what they cut your itemized deductions by. So it, it doesn't necessarily, it may not be a lot, but obviously if your income is $2 million and your threshold is 300, you could lose a lot, of, you know, 3% of that's a lot of, um, so it's just something to be aware of. It's just, uh, they're not, you know, they're not haircutting it all together. It's just kind of, they're putting a limit. It, it's another way, obviously, for them to raise taxes, right? They say we don't raise the tax rate, but we take away deductions and we accomplish the same thing. It's the more uh, po politically uh, acceptable way to do it, right? right? Rather than raising tax rates. Um, so these things are important because at year end, some of the things we taught, one of the ones we talked about was prepaying, right? So we said, okay, maybe prepay your rental stuff, but some people like to prepay their property taxes on their primary homes. Um, for those people who gift to their church, they might be discussing with their tax advisors on pre-funding church donations or tithing. So calculations have to be done, you know, before you run out and just start prepaying everything and gifting everything. Um, make sure that your tax advisor is running the numbers because what you don't want to do is to give or prepay so much that you start to get limited based on the new limitations for your deduction. Yeah, I mean, maybe next year, maybe you're above that threshold this year, maybe next year you might be a slightly below that threshold. So. Maybe if, in that example, maybe if you deferred one of those donations to next year, you might not lose 3% of it or, you know, that's where it kind of run the numbers and see what makes sense. Um, that also brings up a good point is it's November, you know, in terms of year-end tax planning and sitting down with your tax advisor, it's really going to be most effective if you have got a good grasp on what your year-to-date numbers are. It's going to be very challenging for them or for someone like us to help our client if they come in and like, oh, well, I think it's this, but I'm not really sure. I don't have financial statements for this business. So the, the sooner you can get organized, if you're not already organized and having monthly or quarterly financial statements done, the better off it's going to be in terms of the long run and the short run for you to you know, plan accordingly and get you know, effective planning done. Yeah, and for year in tax planning, your financials don't have to be exact. Okay, so if you think you made between 100 and 120,000, that's probably good enough. But if you're coming in saying, well, I think I might have made 100000 or I might have made nothing after I ex deduct my expenses, that would be much harder to plan, right? Because we don't know if there's actually going to be any taxes due. But a small variance is fine. Don't feel like right now you have to go through all the receipts and get everything exactly what it has to be. Okay, just a good estimate. Okay, let's talk about income shifting. Um, we talked about income deferral, but really what income shifting we're talking about is how can we shift income from our high tax brackets to a low or zero tax brackets of our children or maybe other family members. And so we see this a lot because, you know, real estate, you, you, you know, if you guys have kids, I mean, what's, what's the most, ex what's the, the biggest cost you incur in your, in your, <laughs> your life, right, is your children, right? I mean... We, uh, Bruce didn't mention this, but we're actually married to each other, and we have a four-year-old. Now, he's not super expensive on the grand scheme of things yet, but I'm sure he's going to get there. But, you know, kids, they want to, you know, especially teenagers, right? They want to go out. They want to, you know, go without their friends, go to movies, and they want you to fund that, right? <laughs> so It's an investment. Right. It's investment <laughs> in their future. So that what we're talking about here is trying to find a way to take a tax deduction for the money that you're probably already giving them anyway, 
you're probably already giving them allowance. You're probably giving them money for those movies or what have you. So if you can incorporate them into your business, get them helping you in your business, not only is it going to help, could help you from a tax perspective, but obviously it could teach, teach them good working habits, good sense of responsibility. Um, you can kind of see whether it, that would be in the long-term future of your child working for you in your business or not. I mean, that, or, you know, we talk about kids, but obviously it could be, could be parents too. You know, parents are aging, but they're working longer and longer and, you know, doing it effectively. And so maybe it's some situation where they're in a lower tax bracket. Maybe you're supporting your parents, and now it's a way for them to kind of do some whatever, administrative work for your business that you could pay them for. So in terms of year-end tax planning, you know, what, what to do now for this, this is really one that's really important to kind of think about and put in place now because it becomes very challenging if you sit down with us in April and say, how do I take a tax deduction for the money I gave them last year? That's next to impossible. Um, so now is the time to kind of think about, you know, what are they doing for you? What can they do for your business? What can, they, what can you pay them? Whether you put them on W-2 or payroll will depend on your situation and, and the kind of business structure you have. But it needs to be something that formal where it's you're giving them checks and they're you know, keeping a record of what they're doing, uh, job descriptions. Um. I mean, essentially, hiring your kids should be like hiring anyone else who's working for you, right? So just because it's your child does not mean you should pay them $1,000 an hour, right? Or it doesn't mean that they don't need to log in time. So the best way to audit proof yourself is to treat them just as if you're hiring someone else, which means the job descriptions and the time log. And um, one of the questions we get a lot is how old do my kids have to be before I pay them? And so what I always say is you've seen diaper commercials, right? We've all seen those cute little butts moving across the screen with the diaper. So kids any age can be paid. The IRS does not have a limitation on what age they have to be, but they do require the payment be reasonable for what they're doing. Okay. So all you, all you strategically minded thinkers out there, you're thinking, well, you know, can my three-year-old be my IT consultant? Yeah, you know, <laughs> probably, probably a stretch, but you know, I don't know, maybe a 12-year-old could do a lot more on your computer than you can. I mean, you look at this computer, we, 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 we looked at this picture and thought, that's cool, the dad's helping the kids, teaching them something about the computer, but it's probably actually the other way around, right? Like, he's like, wow, that's, that's the internet, that's Google, like. <laughs> yes, so in terms of year-end, making sure that, you know, the payments are actually made, um, if they're supposed to be a W-2, meaning, you know, typically the younger kids are more likely going to be W-2. If you have older kids, maybe college or older, it's more reasonable that they would be a consultant, right, acting as a consulting level using their own tools. Um, so then make sure 1099s issue. So those are the types of things that you document when you utilize this strategy, okay? And of course, um, like I said earlier, make sure the money actually moves hands. So we can't just verbally say, oh, I'm paying my kids. The money actually has to leave your account or your LLC account and go into their account. Okay. Now, you could still be a, a signer or a guardian or in trust of that account, and that's fine. I think kind of looking at an example, we, we met with a client, I think this is two years ago now. We, it was probably in November, and we were sitting down, and we were just chit-chatting at the beginning of the meeting, oh, what's going on this weekend? Oh, I'm going out to fix some of my property. She, she had some rentals. She had some fix and flip, but she was also, you know, she was working full-time at her job, but she had two teenage sons, and she's like, oh, I'm going to have to kids go out and help, help, uh, help me with the properties. And, you know, obviously our dork tax minds start going, cha-ching, cha-ching, you know, bells are ringing in our head. And we're like, oh, well, have you thought about hiring your kids in your business? No, I hadn't really thought about that before. And so we kind of walked her through the process. And, you know, between then and year end, in terms of all the help, she was able to, I think she ended up giving them each about $5,000. And so for her, she was in a very high tax bracket. I would say, if I remember correctly, 38 39%. So paying $10,000 to her kids that she was probably otherwise giving them already, remember, that saved her about $4,000 in taxes. And so the kids, they're, you know, they're making, that was, I think, the only job they had at the time. So from an income tax perspective, they're not paying any, that, they're not paying any income tax on that. So it's going from 38% to zero. Um, it's all staying in the family, obviously. So that's really what we're talking about here and just ways that you can kind of shift it to maybe lower tax brackets and you know, have them help you in the business, obviously. 
And just to add to that, the kids don't have to be in zero tax brackets. So we have clients who have kids that are working, they have another job, maybe they're only working part-time or they're at low tax rates. It still could make sense to shift income to them, okay, if it's possible for them to help you out in your real estate or your business. Because if you're at 35% rate, they're at 10% rate, you're still getting the actual tax savings on the rate differential between you and your kids, okay? Yeah. Okay, let's t touch on a sp uh, s really something specific for rental properties. Uh, now, if how many of you guys actually own rental properties in the room? So 90%, if I were to guess, 80%, 90%. So if you've been owning rental properties for, for a while, you probably know that taking depreciation on your rental property is kind of one of the, at least in our eyes, it's kind of like tax, tax 101. It's basic tax stuff. Um, now, as a side note, we do see that missed a lot, unfortunately. So... But, you know, the, the question is, how can we supercharge that depreciation that we are taking? So the goal is, you know, to have rental properties cash flow positive, but with some of the, with some of the deductions you get, your repairs and things of like that, and, and some of these other strategies we're talking about, along with depreciation, how do we get that, that positive number down to zero or even a loss for tax purposes? So with, with depreciation, typically most people, what they do is they take the property, they split it out between land and building and they depreciate the building over 27 and a half years if it's residential or 39 years if it's commercial. But what the cost segregation allows us to do is it allows us to take that building and break it out into smaller components that would qualify for a five year depreciable life or seven years or 10 or 15. So that you're actually in effect accelerating that depreciation that you were otherwise getting. Now you can take it over five years, seven, 15 so you're basically increasing your expense in the early years. You're getting the same amount of depreciation over the life of the property. Nothing's changing there. It's just you're taking it sooner than later. And so we've seen that this, is, this can become very powerful in terms of, especially like I said, if you're in a situation where you have got positive numbers from your rental property showing up on your tax return that you're paying taxes on, is there a way that we can maximize that depreciation? Um, I think one of the common myths with cost segregation is that some people think, well, I've owned the property for 10 years. I can't do it. And that's not actually true. We had a client just a few years ago that that's what his previous CPA told him in because he had owned the property for 10 years. And he had a, it was a, I don't remember the numbers now, but it was a pretty good cash flow and commercial property. And so we sat down with him and with a cost segregation company, ran the numbers, and it ended up cutting, I think, $200,000 of taxable income off of his return. And I, you know, I don't, like I said, I don't remember exact numbers, but that would have saved him, obviously, a boatload of taxes. Um, so it can still be done, you know, if you bought the property 10 years ago, it can be done if you buy the property today. Um, it just needs, if you want it to be in effect for your 2015 return, you have until the day you file your tax return to actually do the study. So you can, this doesn't need to be done by year end, but you should think about it in terms of what are the opportunities that we can take advantage of that might lower our taxes on our rental properties. Did I see a hand over there? If you're out of depreciation, that's a, that's a, good, that, that's a good question. Um. Buy more real estate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about cost seg. It can't create phantom depreciation. Yeah. Okay, so it is going to be based on the actual, you know, having depreciable basis to work with. Um, a common question I get a lot is um, people tend to hear cost segregation is only for large properties. So commercials, uh, multifamily, okay, that's actually not correct. Cost segregation can be used for all kinds of properties. So, and the benefit of it is based on the purchase price of the property, not the size of the property, okay? So an example would be, if you're someone who bought a, uh, an apartment building in Tennessee, okay, maybe it's a, you know, 10 unit, you pay 300,000, 400,000 for it, right? Or you buy a single family rental in California, which is five, six hundred thousand dollars, right? That's fairly easy to find. So in that scenario, your cost segregation on that single family will probably re result in uh, bet a better uh, deduction than that three hundred thousand Tennessee property, right? Because the calculation again is based on the purchase price. So the next question is, when do we start looking at cost segregation? And typically, when you have depreciable basis of over half a million dollars. Okay. So if you have real estate that, in terms of purchase price for the properties, are over five hundred thousand, 
is when we start to take a look and see, okay, what is the cost to get it done? and what's the potential benefit in terms of tax savings. We usually don't recommend do anything under $500,000 just because from a cost benefit perspective, looking at what are the engineering firms gonna charge versus what is the maximum benefit you can squeeze out of you know, a one or a handful of properties under 500,000, usually it doesn't make sense, okay? And I think for those of you who own properties in California, this can be a, even a little bit more powerful because Typically, at least in Southern California, if you're going to split out land and building, if you go, what most people do is they go to the property tax assessor records and it says land is 70% or 80%. So the, the amount of the depreciable asset, the building, is really small, comparatively speaking. But what these engineering companies can do is they actually have, based on their understanding of the market and what they do, they can actually use a better breakout, more beneficial breakout for you, the investor, than 70% land and 30% building. You might actually get a, a much lower percentage going to land and that therefore allocating more to your building that you can there, thereby depreciate, so. Yeah, I'll give you a really interesting example. I was talking to a guy yesterday. So this guy came to us um, from Bigger Pockets. Um, some of you might be familiar with the website. So um, he realized he never took depreciation all these years on his rentals. So he came to us and we said, I said, okay, what we can do in 2015 is to catch it up because he never took it all those years. So the end result would be about $100,000 worth of depreciation. So he was really happy with that, right? Reduce taxable income by 100,000. But then I said, well, okay, so that's just normal depreciation, but maybe we look at a cost aggregation. Let's see what that would result in. I just got the results back yesterday. I don't even think Matt knows. I got the results back yesterday, same properties, if he were to do a cost segregation and to catch up for all the years he missed, he would reduce his taxable income this year by over $300,000. Yeah. So that's the power of making sure you have all the different components, right? So take depreciation first. That's 101. Everyone has to take it. It's not a choice. If you don't take it, I as assumed you've taken it, and you will have to recapture down the road anyway. Okay, so take depreciation, and then if it makes sense in your situation, you know, at least look at a potential cost segregation. I saw a hand. Was there a question back there? Uh, well, so when I look at it, and you know, it's the 500,000 <coughs> is kind of just my guideline. It's not an IRS rule at all. But 500,000, we look at depreciable basis across all properties. And the depreciable basis would be your purchase price that's allocated to the building. Okay? Because land is not depreciable. So in the cost segregation tax deduction world, it's irrelevant. Okay? But it can, it can be your purchase price plus improvements you plus later on make. Uh, especially if you've been depreciating those improvements over 27 and a half years, they can take that into consideration in, in the study. So. What's the disadvantage of that? The disadvantage of a cost segregation. So a disadvantage uh, would be depreciation recapture, right? Because essentially what we're doing was we're taking future deductions and accelerating it into this year. So an example of someone who should probably not do cost segregation study would be if um, they're telling me they're gonna sell these properties next year, okay? Because then what that means is we're just accelerating it for one year so that we're gonna pay the tax on it next year. Now it doesn't mean that you should never do it, okay? I do have clients who they know they're gonna sell the property next year, but I would still recommend a cost seg even if it's to defer it one year. An example would be, let's say this year they're getting a bunch of options or bonuses or gain. For some reason, this year they're going to be at the highest tax rate. Maybe next year they're retiring or, or their income will be more normalized. So it's a play on the tax rates between different years. But let's assume rates are the same year after year for that particular person. Then I typically don't recommend cost seg if they're just going to sell in the next one to three years. Okay. So the question was, if can you do a 1031 uh, tax deferred exchange on a property you've done a cost segregation on? The answer is yes. Um, the caveat might be that you may need to do a cost segregation on your replacement property because one of the underlying principles of a tax deferred exchange is that you're exchanging like-kind property for like-kind property. So not to get too technical, but if you have five-year assets in your property you did a cost seg on and you buy a new one and you don't have five-year assets, then you haven't bought up in terms of your five-year property. So you may need to do a cost seg on your replacement property just to make sure all the 
different appreciation classes you're meeting the rules for. Yeah, and I'm actually working on a case right now, Bruce, with that same exact situation. So I have a client, I don't think he's here, I have a client that sold a property in LA, um, just a small duplex, and then he's reinvesting it in the apartment. And this is a big income year for him. So we're looking at cost segregation on all his other properties. And so for this particular one, it would make sense because we already know the replacement property address profile, you know, exactly what's in that building. And so the engineering firms has said, yes, this will be perfect for a cost sec to do the cost sec before the 1031. Um, but like Matt said, you just have to be careful because sometimes doing a cost sec and then a 1031 could create some tax problems. So let me touch on uh, another thing in terms of real estate. So again, well, you know, we all love real estate. We, we're all, a lot of us are rental real estate investors. Um, you know, I was talking about earlier the goal, cash flow positive, but with some of these tax strategies and with depreciation, maybe we can get it to a zero or a loss. If we get it to a loss, then obviously we, we want to deduct it against our other income on a return, right? Well, the IRS says that if you make more than $100,000 a year, uh, they will only let you deduct up to $25,000 of rental losses against your other income. And then when your income reaches one hundred and fifty, that $25,000 cap actually dwindles to zero. And, and the numbers Matt is talking about are for a married filing joint, okay? So it's not per person. So then the question would be, well, how can I take those losses if I have, you know, make more than 150,000 or maybe I have more than $25,000 of losses due to, you know, maximizing the depreciation on a cost seg? Well, you can do that by qualifying as a real estate professional. And that's just a fancy tax term. It doesn't mean you need to have a real estate broker's license or anything like that. All it means is you need to spend 750 hours or more per year in your qualified real estate activities, and you need to spend more time in real estate than you do in your other jobs. So if you are you know, full-time working 2,000 hours a year, that would mean you need to, have to spend 2,001 hours in real estate. But if all you're doing is real estate, then all you need to do is spend 750 hours a year in your real estate. Because the benefit of that would be is if you had that $50,000 loss in your rental properties and you qualify as a real estate professional, now you can deduct that against all of your other sources of income in the current year, saving you taxes, you know, maybe 10, 20 grand, that obviously as an investor we think about, well, that's an extra 20 grand I can turn around and reinvest in another cash flow and property, right? So it's about, you know, saving, keeping more of what you make right now so that you can reinvest that to earn more as opposed to giving it to the IRS. You do, yeah. If, so if you don't qualify as a real estate professional and you aren't able to use your rental losses, they don't go away. You carry them forward the next year. You apply the same rules. Or if you happen to sell one of those properties that has accumulated losses, you can deduct those losses in the year you sell that property. So there, there's, some, there's some opportunity there. So I think we've got a couple minutes left. So we'll take the question, more questions at the end as, as part of the whole panel Q&A, if that's okay. Um, but it, again, this is in our dealing with investors all the time. This is one of the most powerful things. It's one of the things we see more mistakes done than, than should be. So just make sure you're talking to your tax advisor. Make sure you're working with a good tax advisor that understands real estate, obviously. Yeah, because there's no form that says you're a real estate professional. There's actually a special election that you attach to your tax return. So if you feel like you should qualify for the rules, make sure you talk to your tax advisor about it. Um, with respect to year end, it's fairly simple. You know, if you're at 725 hours today, then you need 25 more hours. That's a good time to visit some local real estate clubs, right? Do some bookkeeping for your rentals, um, or maybe attend the Bruce Norris brunch weekend, right? <laughs> yeah. So on uh, retirement planning, we're just going to touch on this because Karin's going to Karin's going to come up next and talk a lot about retirement accounts and self-directed retirement accounts. The kind of thing that we like to the way we look at retirement planning and contributions is if you have the opportunity to put it into retirement as opposed to paying to the IRS. Why not? Um, and there's a lot of different options out there. Just don't think that you're just stuck on the, the traditional IRA or the Roth IRA. Uh, you know, a lot of us know about those. But there's, if you're self-employed, um, there's a lot of You have your own business. There's a lot of opportunities for SEP IRAs, uh, simple IRAs, um, solo 401ks. That's a really popular one and a really powerful one for small businesses. Um, we have clients that use defined benefit plans. And that, that actually is a kind of a supercharging your retirement account, it, it, you know, if you meet the right, you know, kind of client profile for that, that's a way to put in more than sometimes, I don't know, we've seen like $100,000 get put into these things during the year. So um, it's, a, it's a matter of 
sitting down with your advisor, figure out what works in your situation. You know, do you have employees? Are you wanting to cover your employees with retirement contributions? Who's doing the business? What kind of income is the business making? Um, how much is the business making? Those are all the types of questions that you should be talking to your advisor about to figure out in terms of retirement, you know, is there a certain type of account I need to set up before your end? And or does the account need to be funded before your end? Some of them there don't need to be set up or funded by your end, but a lot of them do. So that's why it's kind of crucial in terms of where we are right now to kind of sit down with your advisor and ask those questions. So to recap, what to do before the end of the year, step one is to make sure you get organized, right? Know where we are today. Connect with your tax advisors because believe it or not, your tax advisors will probably take some time off as well for the holidays. Yes, and then, we will. And then just the third one is to implement, implement, right? Just because you know the strategies, make sure you do it, whatever is appropriate by year end. Um, I wanted to let you guys know that we didn't have enough CDs to hand to everyone today, but if you want a copy of this sent to you, um, you can just stop by our booth anytime today um, and the, um, give the girls your email and they'll be able to send you a copy of this, okay? Thank you guys. Thanks.